So, welcome to Dispatch. Bright and early Monday morning, packed in here for the exciting helium discussion. Um, let everyone grab their seats and we'll get started here. Uh, blue sheets are circulating, I assume. People see them somewhere. Okay, good. And thank you, McManus, for taking notes. Um, this is all under the note well. If you have not gone and read the appropriate BCPs, make sure you understand that anything you say in here uh, is covered by them. Uh, so with that, it's, uh, it's pretty, um, we, we don't have a two packed agenda today. We'll start about some of the first things. So first, proposed dates for next time. All right. Okay. So the official MOF submission is earlier than any of our deadlines. So people, if you think you have something that's going to be fairly large, then you really need to start talking about it earlier. Um, so September 28th, that's the deadline just to let us know that you, that you have a topic. And then ideally, October 5th, we want um, the cutoff for charter proposals. And by charter, we mean we want a clear problem statement. That's the important thing, right? And, and the objective of what you want to get done. And then we will announce the topics. Um, we'll, we weren't so good this time, we just put the agenda out there. But And then there's the usual draft submission deadline. Okay. And further details on the wiki. Um, and, and I will highlight on this too, of just the, the BOF agenda. You know, if, if you get this out to us early first, we can help give advice about whether you might want to do it in dispatch or as a major BOF. So. Um, our mailing list, where we're doing our discussion, we'll remind everyone of that. And I think that we will now move on to the reason I'm sure everyone came, which is one of the best turnouts I've seen in dispatch a long time. Thank you for all coming. Um, the helium drive. So. <laughs> Good morning. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm here to talk about a new... Oh, it is working. Uh, okay, then I'll have to figure out how to use it. The, uh, thanks for everybody for coming. This is a very early stage proposal. Unfortunately, due to the ordering of HTTP BIS and dispatch uh, this meeting, things are, are in a little bit of a confusing order. So uh, I'll be talking about this part of uh, of a larger idea here in dispatch. And then Lucas Pardue will be uh, leading a presentation for a few minutes in HTTP BIS on uh, a little bit of a broader perspective on what we're talking about, why we're talking about it. So I'll, I'll try to make this intelligible, even though we're a little bit out of order. So the, the goal here is, is UDP proxying. And the inspiration is the uh, impending arrival of Quick. So HTTP has been self-proxying since HTTP 1.1. So that's the idea that you can, within the HTTP protocol, ask an HTTP server to forward a request for you to some destination. Now, that doesn't mean that the server has to actually do this, but at least it gives you a way to make the request. And participating servers can offer this functionality. When HTTPS was introduced, uh, it was decided that this is an important function that HTTP serves. And so HTTP was extended to be able to maintain this functionality for HTTPS in the form of HTTP Connect. That lets you forward an HTTPS connection to a remote destination. But what about HTTP over Quick? Currently, if you set up a proxy, browsers have to actually disable all of their Quick functionality. Because there's no way to ask the proxy to forward a Quick stream to a destination because Quick runs over UDP and there's no HTTP mechanism for forwarding UDP packets. So that is the inspiration here. Could we have UDP proxying in an HTTP 
system so that we maintain this self-proxying feature for Quick. And if we're going to be doing UDP proxying, then, well, it's useful for a bunch of other stuff, too. It's useful for WebRTC, which currently uses Turn as a, as a UDP forwarder. Uh, and also, you know, it's a, UDP forwarding is a lot like VPNs. I'll get back to that in a second. You know, could we somehow cover some of those use cases, too? Maybe we could even do something that's sort of halfway between a UDP proxy and a VPN. Uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. So the goal is uh, to see if we could find a protocol that could cover all these different use cases. It's pretty simple and really works nicely in an HTTP-oriented system. So uh, my claim to you is that a UDP proxy, so here's the, on the left here, this is basically my, my summary of the features offered to you by turn. Uh, it gives you IP addresses, it gives you uh, the contents of UDP, UDP header, it gives you the contents of the UDP payload, it gives you a stable port mapping. This is just IP and NAT in a in sort of in a different formulation. But fundamentally, the, the information that we're talking about here is the information that's in an IP packet. And the function that the proxy is serving is very similar to the function that a NAT is serving in a network. Um, of course, the, the pieces have been taken apart and put together in a different order. But, uh, but that's the data that we're really moving. So this is the Helium idea. The idea is maybe instead of building a UDP proxy in an explicit way, like TURN does or like SOX5 UDP does, maybe we could just take UDP and put it on top of IP and just use the IP header to move that information. Uh, and then maybe there's some kind of tiny wrapper that we need around IP if there's a little bit of information that doesn't quite fit into the IP header. And then all that can run over some sort of really good transport that gives us message-oriented semantics, security, congestion control, flow control, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so we don't have to reinvent all of that. So uh, the Helium uh, describes two things. It describes in first an abstract protocol and then uh, one sort of concrete possible instantiation of that protocol. So the, the abstract protocol actually barely even mentions UDP. It just describes something based on IP, but it's designed to be usable in UDP-only systems. Uh, there's this thing which uh, is probably going to get renamed, uh, currently called Helium Inner Protocol. It's just a very thin header. I'll show it on the next slide. It just has a, a tiny bit of information that you might want to add uh, in addition to what's in an IP packet. And then it, transport is uh, sort of not specified at that layer. And then there's a concrete instantiation. So in, in a concrete instantiation, you, you would take that header and encode it in some way. So I present a, a, uh, an example of encoding it in Seabor. And then uh, you can squish all of that into a WebSocket message. And now you have uh, a full UDP proxy that has the security properties that we want that can be multiplexed with HTTP and HTTP2, that can benefit from all of HTTP's uh, identity and authorization systems, et cetera. So here's the, uh, the entire, actually basically the, the entire Helium protocol in a nutshell. Um, you can send a packet, you can receive a packet, and the one sort of interesting new thing really, well, uh, I'll cover a, a few more of these details on the next slide, uh, is that you can find out what happened to your packet. So uh, that, I think, is uh, my view here is that basically this is what distinguishes a proxy from a VPN, essentially. VPNs forward your packets, and in the process, they have to transform them in a certain way. And generally, there's no way to, for you to find out exactly how that transformation occurred. If you can send a packet and also understand on the client what transformations the remote endpoint applied to your packet, then I claim that that essentially is a proxy server in the, in the sense that we're talking about. So the goal here is to sort of split the difference or to cover both cases. So the, the most interesting thing here, there's a, uh, I'll talk in, in a little more detail about some of the fields here and why they're here. As I said, this is all very early stage work. So I don't expect that this is going to just you know, stay this way. But the most interesting mechanism here is the thing at the bottom, the last line, that uh, the way you find out what happened to your packet is that 
the server echoes to you uh, if you request uh, this information. The server will echo to you a packet prefix containing any modified portions of the outbound packet. So you send a packet, the server had to modify it in certain ways, and you get, you get uh, if you want, an echo back of any aspects of the packet that were altered. So this is basically an ICMP style mechanism for building a proxy. So this is inspired by ICMP error responses, where if something strange happens in the network, um, you can try to find out what happened because ICMP will, will show you the beginning of your packet. So uh, this allows us to avoid inventing a new protocol for ultimately transmitting a bunch of IP related information and also potentially headers beyond the IP header. So if your proxy server needs to do things like rewrite UDP source ports, that's fine. You can totally do that. But then uh, if, the, if the client requests this meta reply, then the proxy should echo back a prefix of the packet, including any parts that were modified, which extends out to the UDP header. So of course, if you're behind a NAT, this is all lies. Sure, if the proxy server itself is behind a NAT, then, uh, then your, this only extends as far as the edge of the proxy server. I mean, which can totally happen, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, the, the goal here is that there's no artificial limitations within the protocol. So for example, turn uh, explicitly is unable to, uh, to represent a, a bunch of, of different things that you might want. Uh, most notably, it's, it's unable to represent ICMP, for example. So you can't do uh, things like PathMTU discovery or trace route using the standard ICMP mechanisms through a turn server. Uh, but also, this allows us to proxy any kind of potentially crazy uh, IP packet that you might want to form. Now, I'm, there's no guarantee here that it's going to work. In a sense, everything about this design is best effort. And, uh, but crucially, if anything doesn't work, you can always find out because you can get a reply from the proxy that says, no, actually, I'm not capable of doing whatever weird IP <coughs> extension you asked for or weird IP option you, you proposed doing. Uh, so here's, here's some fun stuff that you can do in this, in this very simple design. Um, you can build a, a UDP and ICMP proxy that doesn't require socket raw, sock raw style access, right? You don't actually need to be able to form IP headers. This is inspired by the uh, stun trace route draft from, uh, uh, well, from the, the stun proposal. So that you, can, you can actually just use the error codes in the POSIX socket API to uh, basically totally build a, a thing that will proxy both UDP and ICMP, which could be useful for uh, more advanced clients. There's a, one of the reasons, so that there's a, a lot of people who've contributed uh, ideas here. I'm not sure they all actually want to be credited, but uh, w one of the goals here is to build something that can help bridge networks, especially cell networks that have uh, two parts to the path with very different path characteristics, a wireless leg and then a, you know, a leg through the, through the core of the internet. So the, the proxy adds timestamps. Actually, it, it can timestamp both incoming and outgoing packets. And uh, a timing aware client side congestion controller could use that to separately observe latency past the proxy, between the proxy and the destination. So core congestion, and latency on the client to proxy <coughs> link through whatever transport is being used. So that could allow more advanced congestion control systems that, uh, that adapt. And uh, the goal here is to be able to avoid some of the TCP over TCP um, serious misbehaviors that, that can easily occur when you have multiple layers of congestion control and, and packet loss recovery. Uh, domain override is, uh, is in here so that in a quick context, for example, you might want to contact a server by name. Uh, it would be nice to avoid having to do a DNS lookup through the proxy and get an IP address and then try again. So domain override says, I'm just going to ask the proxy to send this packet to a particular domain. 
and there's a little bit of language about uh, how that has to work in order to make that actually function correctly. Uh, and then DNS server indexes, is what if I want to do DNS queries to, uh, to the proxy's preferred DNS resolver? So I want to use a local a nearby resolver for that network. But I, I don't just want to send address queries. I don't just want to connect to some IP address. I actually want to do TLSA lookups or ESNI lookups or, or whatever. The, this, this would allow that. Um, so there's a, a bunch of other weird stuff. Uh, the last thing here is kind of funny. Uh, so if you want to bind an address, you can, uh, there's no explicit command here because there's, there's no even explicit knowledge of, for example, what UDP is in this protocol. Uh, but there's NAT, and so if you send uh, if you send a packet, then you're effectively binding an address, and you can use the meta reply to find out what address it was because your your source port is rewritten. <coughs> so that's a that's about it for for the helium itself. And, and the other concept here is how would you use this over a WebSocket? So the idea here is that if a client is aware of a protocol like this and the server wants to implement it. Then first, the server, uh, so on the left, this is an, uh, a standard proxy connection to a server. So on the left, the server can say, by the way, here's a, here's a, a Helium proxy that I'm operating that you are also welcome to use. And on the right, this is the, the client actually connecting to that proxy. So reissuing their proxy authorization header to show that they're still authorized to use it and indicating the protocol uh, and also, just for fun, uh, indicating compression, because WebSockets support compression, so uh, you can actually uh, zip your, your packets as, uh, on the web. Okay. So uh, that's, that's Helium. And I uh, welcome any, any thoughts on what to do with this, uh, with this idea or even just with this problem. I just have a sort of clarifying question about the, the sort of the NAT side of it to a certain degree, which is um, in some of the other stuff we've discussed sort of uh, filtering, this this binding address idea, right? What what do you envision it will do? I mean, would different clients on the inside be able to use the same port number on the outbound side? Would traffic come, would you have to send to an address before somebody could, before you could receive from that address from a filtering point of view? I'm just trying to get what sort of security properties you see the outside of this pseudo NAT having. Sure. My expectation, uh, the the current, you know, this is a zero zero, but the the current language in the draft says uh, I believe that the that the proxy must uh, it. So so if the proxy is UDP aware. We should say because it's actually possible to build a, a helium proxy that doesn't even know what UDP is that operates strictly at the IP layer. But if you if you build a helium proxy that is UDP aware, uh, the draft says that it should uh, that it should have address dependent filtering semantics. So so it should essentially be uh, um, or actually it recommends full cone behavior basically. Uh, but this, well, we can talk more about that. Adam Roach, just as an individual, I'm um, trying to figure out the UDP protocols you see riding on top of this. Is this like for real time, or is this like almost explicitly for tunneling quick and, and other similar things? Uh, I, I'm trying to, my, my goal is to see if we can find a, a very general purpose solution. So, okay. I'm, the concern that I have here is I look at, you know, you go back to the protocol stack slide, it's I see a UDP near the top and I see a TCP near the bottom and that's a red flag for me, right? Yes. So this is definitely a concern. Um, one of the ideas in here is that uh, eventually the, the goal here is to enable quick over HTTP over quick type um, proxying. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, just in the same way that you can do uh, that, you can currently do HTTPS over HTTPS proxying. 
So, sure, but those are, I mean, those have the same basic protocols. It's not like head of line blocking is going to really trip you up there. Yes, I agree. So, uh, one of the things that I'm interested in here is that there's been, there's been some talk of, of WebSocket-like systems that run over Quick. And so my, or, uh, so, so the WebSocket here is, is an initial option because it, it's something that's available today and it's, I think, about as good as we can do over TCP. Uh, well, but TCP is kind of the problem, right? I mean, I mean, if you want a construct that is like accessible from inside browsers, I guess data channels kind of gets you there. But so, my the part of the goal here is to run over HTTP to be self-proxying in the way that HTTP is self-proxying. Okay. Uh, so right now, you can run uh, you can run a T, uh, an HTTPS proxy over Quick. So you can forward a TCP stream. <laughs> real quick by running HTTP connect. Right. Uh, and so essentially the goal here I think is to to decouple these things, to run at a, at a high enough semantic layer that the, you know, that we run essentially over HTTP or over some HTTP related protocol and then HTTP itself hopefully will run over quick and uh, and so we will at least have have an option that has the right uh, performance characteristics. Okay, I, I guess the, the the headline then is we probably need some really like clear language in here that caveats if you do this, things will probably go badly for you under a lot of circumstances. Sure. So so Lucas will be presenting this afternoon an alternative version of this that instead of doing web sockets, one of the things he he he's proposed is defining a new HTTP two frame type, with the idea that new frame types have a have uh, an easier path toward out of order behaviors on quick. Okay, thanks. Harold Augustron, can you go back to your first slide? That one. I believe that the first bullet is the way I understand the words proxy and HTTP is false. As in the the inclusion of the domain of the address of the server in the identity of the of, of the of the resource was a stupid design mistake of HTTP 0 0.9, and uh, the host header was an attempt to get us out of that rat hole. We haven't gotten out of it, but I believe the, that substantially the first first sentence there is false. So we, we actually have that syntax in active use because it's, it, it allows us to do caching, but caches are not proxies. And second, I'm worried about uh, running two congestion control mechanisms on top of each other. It's a stupid idea. It was a stupid idea in ATM. It was a stupid idea in, in uh, in uh, this radio link protocol that we keep on using. It was a stupid idea in many different contexts and it will, I think it will remain a stupid idea in the future. So either this works, this assumes that there is no congestion between the proxy and the, and the client or so that uh, that link runs at full speed all the time or it will get into interesting resource problems. Third problem I have here is that this concept of UDP, you're defining a service for putting packets on the internet and surrounding it with a lot of uh, pointers towards things like DNS and address allocation and ICMP and so on. But uh, you talk as if you provide UDP to the client. Now, about 10 years ago, we had the, no, 15 years ago, we had the protocol for, for telling your netbox to send packets on your behalf, RSIP. And uh, it never took off. But if you want to have a way to tell a proxy to put UDP packets on, on the network on your behalf, I think you can do a lot cleaner than this. I mean, I find this uh, whole, uh, Thing very complex and 
with very little architectural thinking behind it, and that makes me sad. Probably there's a use case in there that uh, you that you find useful since you're standing here talking about this, but I don't understand. I but I don't see an architecture I can understand inside it. Okay, uh, I, I didn't I didn't hear a question, so I guess I don't uh, don't have to answer. Nicely done, um, Martin Thompson. Um, that was a lot of negativity from Harold here. Um, I I think a lot of those concerns are ones that we need to address, though. Um, I'm far more positive on this. I think that the general idea that you have, the the, the goals that you're you're looking to address, are, are quite fine. Um, the way that in which you're going about it gives me all kinds of bad feelings and. Harold managed to capture a lot of those um, fairly well. Um, maybe I disagree with him about the, uh, the relative utility of having the full URI in a request, but that's just a minor point. Um, I'm sort of wondering whether or not this is turn that you're looking for here. Sure. So uh, tur turn is, is interesting. It's possible. Um, I think turn has its own problems, right? Turn inherits stun syntax and has a, a bunch of weirdness, like it, the XORing, the addresses with some. I'm talking architecturally. Thing. I'm talking um, architecturally rather than the actual sure. manifestation of the protocol. The, the, the protocol's got all sorts of warts on it, and some of them are fine, and some right. of them we don't like, and some of them won't really be necessary in this context, sure. and a bunch of other questions like that. But fundamentally, the, there's a lot there that has been thought about and, and mm -hmm. you know, turn TCP is a thing and it has all of the properties that Harold was complaining about but it exists and it, it's a necessary evil in some contexts and so maybe maybe that's something that we we should be looking at instead I definitely think that Lucas's design is is closer to to what we want in in that respect I think that okay. the the idea that um, you have quick to some point and then you want to initiate say, quick again, from that remote endpoint is an interesting one and, and one that I think we should be examining a little bit more. But um. Yeah, so I, I fully recognize that this design is very different from the kinds of, uh, of proxy protocols that, uh, that we normally talk about. Um, and in particular, it has these, this, this very strange best effort only semantic where um, at almost every step, there's uh, there's no clear guarantee about what you're going to get, uh, and th that sort of reflects a pessimistic view of uh, of of connectivity on the internet. Basically, an idea that like you have to build your protocols to assume there are middle boxes in the way, so we're just going to be one more middle box, and uh, we're going to get your packets where uh, where they go if we can. Yeah. I, I, I think you, you, there's a number of inherent assumptions in the design that you're presenting that uh, that aren't, aren't being well explained. In that, sure. In that role. So, so in terms of turn, I'll just mention to you that uh, turn has a number of interesting characteristics. One of them is that it proposes copying all of the IP uh, IP flags, basically things like ECN and, and DSCP, from the IP layer itself on the turn link. To the uh, to the external link and vice versa, as because it has no way internally of representing any of those flags. So if you essentially believe that those things don't matter, that that IP doesn't have any attributes other than addresses, then uh, and doesn't contain any protocols other than UDP, then turn is is a very reasonable approach, and and I would be fine with that. I think the question here, you know, this is a like, like the name says, this is a hybrid encapsulation for both IP and UDP. And I think the, the question is whether there is demand beyond the, the baseline of the simplest UDP. Mike Bishop, Akamai, and also HTTP over quick doc editor. So I definitely think being able to do an HTTP quick equivalent to connect that would get you another HTTP quick connection is something we're going to need assuming this quick thing takes off. 
because currently that's how you get a TLS connection past proxy is you do a connect. And to say that people behind proxies cannot use quick to do encrypted connections out to the internet is kind of sad. <clears throat> now, one thing I would point out on your architectural slide that you have the, the yes, the abstract layering and then one instantiation. This is really not the instantiation you want. It's just kind of the best instantiation you can have right now. Yeah. Because you want something with message semantics, at least. So there, you know, that's where you wind up in WebSockets. And fine, we can do H, uh, WebSocket over H2. That draft is, I think, going to ISG soonish. We can port that reasonably simply into HTTP over quick. Fine. <coughs> but the quick stream is still in order. Yes. And it's going to have head of line blocking. I think you at least have a way out from the congestion problem by having timestamps on it so that maybe we can sidestep that congestion control inside congestion control. And you're, you're essentially doing remote congestion controlling. But where you ultimately want is a feature that Quick doesn't have yet, which is to have a message level, message semantic inside Quick, maybe associated with a stream, maybe not, but something yeah. Quick doesn't have, and you have a feature request for Quick. Yeah, and uh, and I guess I have a, a question mark in here about whether we're going to reuse the term WebSocket in some way to describe some way of exposing that upper layer or whether we're going to have to go into HTTP quick every time we want those semantics. I don't know whether it would be called WebSockets, but it certainly would not look like current WebSockets. I just want to work. I cut the line after Ted, but thank you very much. Justin Newberry, Google. Um, just speaking to the whole congestion control and side congestion control point. Now, philosophically, I understand the distaste here, but sort of speaking uh, for someone who's running on a very large turn deployment, that I, in practice, we actually see these issues are not nearly as bad as you would think they would be. And that turn TCP actually works quite well, especially when you're using Nagle or have Nagle disabled on the actual TCP mic. And even in the cases where it actually turns out to be a problem, there are actually some clever solutions, like you can have multiple TCP connections for a single sort of remote endpoint, and then you can sort of round robin between them to deal with head and mind blocking. So, like, we may find this kind of architecturally, like, inelegant, but there are some mechanisms that are well tested and can actually solve these problems. Uh, Bernard of Microsoft. Um, yeah, I actually agree with Justin. That these things are very fixable with a, appropriate communication between the layers. But I actually was come up here to try to uh, cancel out most of Harold's negativity by trying to <laughs> say a lot of positive things. Um, I think the problem you may have here is there are actually too many good problems you're trying to solve. Um, and it may help to focus on a few. Certainly, I think the proxy one is, is definitely very needed. So you could do that one. Um, and there, uh, but also, I won't. Uh, I will say uh, that I'm not a lover of turn. I think it has a huge number of scalability problems, which could be potentially fixed by some of the ideas you have there. But that might be I'm not saying you have to do all those things at once. But maybe if you focus on one problem and then focus on another problem, maybe you'll see common error, and maybe you won't, and maybe those end up being two different things. But anyway. I like to encourage people when they come to ITF instead of being abused to come come out with a positive attitude and know people think that they should come back. So Sibo Langer. I had one clarification question and then follow up after that. Um, so it seems like in the document I sort of read through it and it seems like you're assuming that are you assuming that the end server, the target server which is sitting behind the proxy, actually has no idea of the hybrid encapsulation protocol at all? Yes. Yeah, so uh, there's like, so I think the difference between, for example, HTTP connects and, sorry. No, 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 not you. Sorry. Oh, too loud? Okay. Cut, no, cut the mic after Ted. And <laughs> no, uh, so I think that the, there is a fundamental difference between uh, the HTTP connect approach to proxying versus the uh, NAT approach to proxying, which is that the, in the HTTP approach to proxying, the end server also cooperates in the encapsulation protocol as well. For example, think... so there's a stream there's a stream ID associated with every data when you want to create a connect tunnel someplace. Uh, so actually, I've, I'm going to go back on that a little bit. Uh, 
the uh, in the in, if you have the I'm going to go back to the, I was actually wrong in that saying that. Uh, but what I'm going to say is that there's another way of doing this where the uh, target server actually also cooperates in the encapsulation protocol, which is, for example, IPIP GRE encapsulation, where, for example, you can enable interesting features like direct server return with those and those things versus actually rewriting IP addresses when you go to traverse through the NAT implies like you have to uh, like uh, correct the checksum when it goes through this NAT. So it involves a lot of performance problems related to that versus HTTP does not have these kind of performance problems. Um, when we do these things like for L3 load balancers, we actually do IP IP encapsulation instead of rewriting the source IP address. So the way I see it, at least, it seems like it's not as applicable to us, our use case, because we would do IP IP encapsulation when we're doing it inside our data centers. But I, I'm curious about which use case this is applicable for. Is it more like a NAT? Or is it more to replace the IP, IP encapsulation that exists right now? I, I guess I would say that this design um, more resembles a NAT for sure. Uh, I, at an ecosystem level, I, I guess I have difficulty imagining how we would get to uh, to a point where end, endpoint servers can be um, relied upon to be aware and participating. Uh, I guess my, my goal here is to be able to contact, at a minimum, any quick server in the world, for example, right? so that you can use this as a, a full forward proxy for all of your web browsing over quick. Right, so in that case, you would have, uh, a, it's similar to an HTTP proxy, and that, that, yeah, that's what you're trying to solve. Uh, Ted Hardy, and indeed, I also came up to talk about a scope thing and to to possibly get you to think a little bit differently about what you're doing so that we can dispatch it, because this is what this working group is about, is figuring out where you go from here. Because what you just said was you wanted minimally to enable any quick server to talk to any other quick server, but then you went into a forward proxy that is HTTP specific. Uh, so you're actually talking about HTTP over quick, which is only one of the use cases of quick that we uh, perceived will occur over time. It's not HTTP3, it's a transport onto which different application layer protocols will go. And so I think you kind of have a choice here. Right? You can go and say, I want this to be very general and I'm not gonna inherit any of the characteristics of the particular application layer protocols because what I'm giving you is a mechanism to encapsulate quick over uh, HTTP and from the point that it's quick over HTTP, it could be quick any application, right? And you have a generalization at that point that you know you could do it with mind touch, you could do it with this, you could do it in a bunch of different ways. But you, you now know that you're using HTTP as a substrate for the transport quick, not the application over quick. Or you can say, hey, no, what I'm really caring about here is the HTTP side of this so that I can use it in the same way that uh, a connect proxy is used and and get from an HTTP over quick, or get to any HTTP over quick server using this facility. And I think we dispatch you in different ways depending on which one that is. And so I think it's really a question that maybe you wanna to talk to uh, a little bit more because in one case I'm gonna say, hey, you actually should go into the queue at quick um, after the HTTP and its next application are done so that we know we can use this over two different applications. And if you're really talking about it uh, in HTTP only terms, I say we ditch fast you to HTTP bits. And in, if in fact you care about being able to use this over something other than quick, then we dispatch you back over to transport to say you're a substrate to transport. So I think there are kind of three different potential scopes for this and the dispatch answer is different depending on scope. So it would be really useful if you could describe which one you ideally want to meet. Sure. Uh, so, uh, oh, great. Well, you can answer Ted if you want. Uh, so I, I think I think that's uh, Lucas in the queue. Um, Lucas has also thought uh, a bunch about these uh, about these different possible use cases and uh, approaches to the problem and has a draft on the topic, so maybe I'll defer to Lucas. Lucas, you, you're, 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah, Ted raises some really great questions and points there. I'd say some of those aspects have been touched on in the um, in the draft I put together, which is using, it, it's framed in terms of HTTP initial, initialization of network tunneling. So we, we use HTTP as a departure point, but don't necessarily use something like HTTP over quick as the substrate for the tunneling. It could, but it doesn't need to be. So many of these aspects have been collected into that uh, ID in terms of design considerations, and uh, we welcome further input. I'll be presenting that along with um, some more explanatory slides around some of the proxy models at uh, tomorrow's HTTP Biz session. So if there's any further comments, uh, I'd really welcome uh, people to come there and, and continue the discussion. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, one other note I want to make uh, is, uh, so I, I'm not sure I entirely correctly understood your, your question, but uh, the, my, my, my working assumption has been that Quick itself, um, because of its encryption, makes it uh, difficult or impossible to determine what use of Quick uh, is, is inside that packet. So, uh, so, so my conclusion has been that uh, anything that can move quick can move uh, HTTP over quick or other things over quick. So, so look, I was talking to Charles a second ago, and we were just, you know, trying to figure out how do we move forward from here. So, so here's 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 our rough straw man from where we're thinking. Are. Okay, there's there's quite a bit of interest in this. There's a lot of issues. There's questions about what the scope is, what the problem. Would we adapt existing protocols? Would we make a new protocol? How would this work with other things? Uh, even questions, and whenever we end up in one of these sort of proxy tunnel type protocols, there's always questions about whether it's transport, whether it's art, how, how that works. So it seems to us that we're at the point where we need some discussion on the list focused on what the big level architecture is, what use cases we're trying to hit, what the, what the big direction is, and, and dig into this just a little bit more on the list and peel the next layer of the onion and have something a bit more specific before we can really dispatch it. Um, and it seems that the dispatch list is as reasonable as any place to go do this right now. This is not obviously that it should be in transport or anything, it would, and it, it, it's going to overlap. We're going to have to coordinate with people, and as it becomes clearer, it'll be, we'll figure that out. But it doesn't quite seem ready to dispatch yet. Um, does this seem like a reasonable path forward? Anyone want to speak against this or suggest something else? Okay, AD, AD is okay with that? Good. Okay. So. Um, I know that sort of seems like unconclusive, like, yeah, keep discussing it. Uh, do more work. Thank you for all the good work you've done. We'll most likely kill you in the morning. Um, but uh, I, 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 like, I, I really think that this is, that there's a lot of pain over our current things, and the, the quick stuff has sort of pushed it to the breaking point. We need to do something. Um, so I, I think we need to make some progress on this and go from there. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. So. That officially ends the dispatch session. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it ends the dispatch session, and we're going to move to the art area meeting. Um, if I can find the slides. Oops, can you get me back on? Master slides. Okay, we have five area directors. No, we have five minutes for them. No, oh, we're all good. Okay. So, boss, and interesting things this week. You can do it too if you want to. I'm going to speak to the first one. Um, so, Right after lunch today, we're going to have a boff talking about how the IETF handles internationalization review and um, considerations in documents. Right now, we don't really have any formalized process around this, and it's it's been raised that it would be really beneficial um, to have some sort of additional supervision around how we handle these. The discussion that's been going on in the mailing list so far is kind of driving towards setting up a directorate and probably putting together an RFC that provides some guidance. But 
you know, not to prejudge the, the conversation we're going to have this afternoon. Um, so if you're interested in this at all, uh, or even if you're just free, I think having more input on this topic is, is useful. Thanks. We all want to talk to RFC++? Plus plus. Is, is anyone in this room not aware of RFC++? Plus plus? <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so, do you want to all talk about the Drew? Actually, I'm not, I, I don't think I could provide much color on that. Does someone in the room want to speak to what's going to happen in the Drew Both? Someone want to speak to what's going to happen in the RFC++ plot? <laughs> yeah, definitely the former. Um, Martin Thompson, I, I know I've been following the, the Drew stuff. It's basically, there's been, been a bunch of things that have happened in, in DNS. Um, discovering a resolver is something that's been left off the table in a lot of those working groups. So Doe specifically did not address that, that question. And there's questions about all of the other DNS over TLS things. I'm going to talk about how they do the, the discovery in that context. Uh, I didn't get any feedback from the chairs of these two working groups, but these two have formed since the last meeting. Um, if they're of interest, they'll be meeting for the first time here. That's it. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. My name is Bernie Hünneisen. I'm working with the PET project, which aims to do opportunistic encryption, privacy by default. And we have submitted five drafts, which means there are three more than last time. Okay. Okay. You hear me now? <laughs> well, we have submitted five drafts all together. Uh, there are three more than last time, and as I have 15 minutes, I can only go shortly into the content of these drafts. But, hmm? Okay, now it works. So I'm bringing again these two slides. For those of you that have been last time here, they are pretty much the same. Uh, just to give a background for those who are new. So we, are we aim to make the text communications like email, chat, private by default. Um, we have good tools for privacy already, uh, but not so many people use them. Actually, almost no one uses them for encryption. Most users are actually unable to use these encryption tools because it's too complicated, too cumbersome, takes too much time. And we intend to fix this challenge by doing that automatically. <laughs> so in summary, we need not just good privacy, we need also easy privacy. <laughs> uh, well, in short, it is, uh, we have several building blocks that already exist. Uh, actually, PEP architecture has several building blocks. Uh, and some of them are already mostly documented in RFCs. And we are intending to use these already uh, existing building blocks from the RFCs. Some pieces are missing or are incomplete. And these are the pieces we are focusing on, like uh, filling the gaps that we can make pretty easy privacy and email encryption opportunistic by default. So this is one of the new slides compared to the last meeting. We've been trying to show you the message flow in a simplified way. So what happens first, whenever you start up your client and you have no key, 
then the client will automatically generate the key pair. And if you want, then you have a privacy status towards the one you, towards every peer you want to send messages to. In this example, we have a privacy status of, of B, of the channel to B, which means unencrypted, because we do not have any public key. Then you send the first message. This message cannot be encrypted because you don't have any key. But what we do, we add to this message your public key so that the other party has the public key. So what you see now happening is that uh, as soon as the message is received at the B party, it will import this public key. And from that moment on, the channel to A is encrypted. And this happens all automatically. B doesn't have to like take the key, uh, key out there, write some like, PGP add and this kind of stuff. It's just done automatically in the client. And from that moment, B sends a message back and all the messages are encrypted automatically and applied. And this means now also the other side is a, an encrypted privacy status. So whenever A sends message to B, they are encrypted. To prevent many in the middle attacks or like a higher degree of security, you also need like establish the trust relationship between the two parties. So this is kind of something that cannot be fully optimized because uh, trust, you cannot do in a technical way, totally. So what you're doing is, or the clients are doing is take the two uh, fingerprints of the, of the keys, merge them together, make them to trust words, which I'm going to explain later. And then you compare these trust words over a phone line or just some alternative channel. And whenever you have successfully completed these trust words, you press a, a button on your email client and from that moment on, the privacy status is trusted, which means that you can be sure that the message you're sending to them are going directly to them and cannot be read by any intermediary. So this is like in short what it is about and now I'm going towards the drafts that we wrote. So this is one of the new drafts. It's basically defining the whole procedures for email. So basically define the missing pieces for email. And the motivation for this, as I mentioned, that the current systems do not encrypt all privacy sensitive information. Current systems still leave the subject unencrypted. For example, there are also other header fields that need to be more careful regarding the encryption. So the main use case is uh, automatically encrypt the emails in opportunistic encryption scenarios, as I just showed on the slide before. We define here some new message formats for privacy and integrity, and also like how this is automatic key generation distribution works that I just explained you in the last slide. And here, just in brief, how one of these message formats works. Basically, this is uh, encapsulation of the email of the original email into the uh, into an encrypted email. So we have the outer message that contains only what is really needed and uh, removes all the privacy sensitive information. And then we have the inner message that contains everything, but this is encrypted. And in the inner message, we have the original headers and the content and the public key and all that. So the outer message looks like a forwarded mail with some encrypted content. Then, for this all to work, we have made a draft that uh, defines the rating states. So the goal is that it's easy, understandable to the user, what is the privacy status to another user. It's like these colors I showed you in this flow diagram before. So that the user sees immediately, okay, emails to these users are encrypted or emails to this user are even uh, authenticated or the user is authenticated to receive emails from you. Uh, the motivation is that the, to reveal the privacy status to the user. The main use cases is the presentation of the status of a user, but also the status of a message. Just for example, the first message is never encrypted, so this one is then like uh, shown in a different color than all the following messages. And there are some other cases where there can be differences between a state communication status to the user and of a message of each message. 
So the most method we are defining here different privacy ratings, and we map these privacy ratings to a traffic light color semantics. So if it's authenticated and uh, encrypted, it will be green, as I showed in this last slide. And if it's just encrypted, it will be yellow. And if there's something wrong, like uh, the breach of a key or something, then it will be red. So that is about that. Then the handshake process I explained you, I'm going back again, which is this uh, lower thing. So what they are doing before it gets uh, from yellow to green is described in the PEP handshake draw. So we define an easy authentication uh, process for communication partners. And the motivation is that for most users, the existing authentication methods are too cumbersome and not reused. So what actually happens is that I explained it already before. We combine the fingerprints with an XOR function, and then we map that to the trust words. I explain you the trust words in the next slide. Then you compare these trust words over the phone line or some other alternative channel and update it. That's in rough, or in short, it's the handshake draft. And then the trust words draft, it's kind of an IANA registry definition draft because we need trust words should be the same for all users or for all uh, implementations. And that's what the IANA registry is a good means for. So we register the word lists in every language that they can be used by the clients. So this is the big picture we have here like four areas, we have the core stuff that is in green, we have the trust words, handshake, uh, authentication stuff that is here in uh, Fuchsia color. Another area is the applications like email or XMPP, and for email we also intend to make a mapping for SMIME. And then there's an area I haven't been talking about yet, it's the area of synchronization of, uh, of keys. In case you have multiple devices, you have one on your mobile phone, one on your uh, computer, one on your tablet. So all these private keys can be synced to devices so that you can actually also decrypt the message that has been encrypted with a private key, uh, with a public key from the other device. And there are some more um, extensions to that. You can also sync the trust state, you can sync calendars and context. There could be like some further development. But the most important is to sync the private keys among the devices. We have running code for Outlook, Android, Thunderbird, it's released as Enigmail, and for iOS, it's a beta version. So that stuff is already running, the stuff we documented here is running. <coughs> then, while we come to ITF, we have of course a limited know-how what's going on in the world outside. We want to improve the compatibility to these existing implementations, we want to make the best BIM-based message formats, define missing URI schemes, as I mentioned before, Diana registry, and also the private key synchronization. Then we discussed with the Chelsea and they said that the dispatch working group is the best way to discuss this for the time being. So whenever you have questions or comments, use the dispatch list. If you want to get the more like in touch with us, we have an IRC channel, we have web forums, and here are our email addresses you could send your questions to. This is my last slide, and I think we can take now questions. Uh, my name is John Clenson. Um, first of all, I want to commend you for trying to look at doing things this way rather than assuming that some sort of hop-to-hop -hop mechanism is helpful. Uh, that said, uh, and with the understanding that I found some of your slides a little hard to read and I'm uh, uh, not sure I understand this proposal until after I get through reading things I haven't read before, like for example, SMTP. Um, uh, I think a careful analysis of what happens and how stable this would be in an environment where messages are passed through third-party relays over whom the endpoints don't have as much control as they sometimes think they do 
<coughs> or uh, or through uh, IMAP and POP uh, servers who can mess with the messages and make certain that everything holds together under conditions of possibly slightly hostile actors in those environments. I think my colleague is better to answer this question because he's more into it. Uh, Minority Marcus from PEP Foundation. There is also a company uh, trying to put that into business environments, PEP security, and they uh, also talk with companies with exactly these um, uh, issues that they want to probably do virus, virus protection or to ensure that uh, certain information doesn't leave the company. So for such cases, you can, of course, do key escrow inside the company or when it comes to archiving, you can also, um, there's also, that's in the general draft somehow mentioned, there's also a, a trusted server mode where you can save your messages unencrypted such that you can you know, read them without having keys. Um, so there are different methods how you can deal with that. Uh, of course, you need to trust your, at least your own infrastructure in the end, otherwise, uh, yeah, it's for nothing, all this encryption things. So the project uh, focuses ba basically on, on targeting yeah, mass surveillance. So if, if you need to somehow read messages of other people inside corporations, then yeah, you need solutions there, that's clear, yeah. But for, let's say, private users, uh, you need to, to do that things on the end devices then to analyze after decryption what's going on. I'd like to conduct an extremely quick poll for everybody in the room who either now works for or has worked before for a very large company. Would all of you who love your IT, unless you're part of the IT department, would all of you who love your IT department and trust them put your hands up? Uh, I'm Keith Moore. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to uh, commend you for taking this approach and looking at it, and and I appreciate what you're trying to do here. Uh, it appears that one of your assumptions is that the easiest thing to to the most malleable piece or the place that you can make the change to implement this is in the user agents, and not in say any of the structure. Um, I'm a bit dubious of that assumption just because history seems to say that there's not a lot of incentive to improve user agents. I'd like to believe that we're not the case, but I'm, like I say, I'm somewhat doubtful. Uh, the other thing that I would take serious reservations with is the idea that it's okay to have devices exchange private keys with one another. Uh, and I want to really caution against the assumption that this acts on my behalf in any respect. Because what I have found personally is that this is a huge security hole. This is dangerous. This thing has entirely too much information about me. It is too easily compromised. And so I will never trust anything that expects this thing to exchange its private credentials with other devices. That is a non-starter. Yeah, uh, me, uh, me neither. I wouldn't use email on a, <laughs> on a cell phone. But um, th there is the use case where, where, let's say, a CEO or whatever wants to run around and read his email, so you can decide at least for certain mail addresses to do that, and for others not. I mean, that's like... That's I understand why you want to do it. What I'm telling you is it's an extremely bad idea, and it will get serious scrutiny. Yeah. But it's at least a use case which exists where people want to do that. But I, I agree that... Yeah, yeah I agree. That, uh, that the devices are fucked up, basically, the, all of them. That, that, that's We're going to cut the line after the current people on the line, so that's good. That's a technical term, right? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he's sort of invisible, but so he snuck in under the wire. <laughs> yeah, well, well, it has to be less negative. <laughs> this is Barry Leba. The, the history of adding creatures to email has shown that the, the, they work they succeed based on compatibility with what came before. And MIME 
was a perfect example of that where when most clients didn't support MIME, messages that came, MIME messages that came through looked reasonably good and people could understand what was going on. When we did PGP and SMIME, we set it up in a way that you can't read the encrypted message, but you can at least, you see who it's from and what the subject is and you can go find out if, you're, if you can't decrypt it, you know where to go to find out what's going on. With this kind of mechanism, the user experience for when, when the user has a client that doesn't support this is miserable. Right? The user just gets a blob in their email that says PEP, and they have no idea who it's from, what the subject is, how to find out how to fix this issue. So I'm concerned about that. And go ahead and respond to that while I think about the second well, piece. If the user has made a public key, then he is getting the, these kind of messages. If he never made a public key, he's unlikely to get these kind of messages because they're only encrypted. Uh, then the, this. So go back to your beginning, your, your flow diagram there. And here's your thing where you... Um, so if, if someone wants to send me an encrypted message mm -hmm. and they have their key set up already, mm -hmm. what happens here? Which, um, if there is already a key pair which we consider sufficiently long for RS8, it would be 2048, um, then we just use that. Otherwise, a new is, can, is generated if it's not sufficient. I mean, there is an author rating part which is not yet in, in the rating draft where it's about uh, rating crypto, uh, crypto which we consider strong enough. And um, um, yeah, I mean, in, in cases where we would say it's not enough, we would generate just a new one and use that. Brain check. I'm, I okay. think I now understand what uh, what I missed at the beginning. So if, if, if A wants to send B an encrypted message, A sends it over there, but B is not prepared to generate a key and respond with an encrypted message back, so nothing happens. Is that correct? I mean, you mean if, if you have a key for B, but he's not prepared to decrypt or what? Or? A wants to send an encrypted message to B. Oh, you know, if there's no way to encrypt, it goes right, unencrypted. It just, so it's never going to connect. The handshake is never going to happen. It just attaches the public key, right. but there's that, the that handshake may, is, is optional anyhow. Okay, That's that may mitigate my, my concern. The other part of the concern is what happens in failure conditions. Um, is I suggest that you take a really hard look at how to deal with that because that's been a major problem with deployment of SMIME. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's one challenge. <laughs> Bron Gondwana. Um, I, I, we talked a little bit yesterday, so you know a lot of my concerns about this, that um, email is something that is an archive for a long period of time and that key management, it's easy to hand wave key management, but key management is a real issue. Assuming a working PKI doesn't doesn't scale, assume devices are safe, doesn't scale. You've given a lot of ideas that there might be key escrow, there may be different people having different attitudes for how how secure they believe their devices are, etc. It feels like there's a lot of complexity and a lot of work for the users involved still for a, a easy privacy and a lot of decisions that people just don't make. Um, as soon as you start giving lots of different options and lots of different ways of looking at things, people won't use them because it gets too complex. So I, I would be concerned about having a lot of different ways to interact with this because the default will either be insecure or unusable if there are too many different ways. Hi, I love this channel. Yeah very commendable that you want to do this and uh, very nice that if that you'll paint you'll paint my mailbox yellow if it if you succeed and, <laughs> but my big worry about this architecture is actually private key exchange because the way you've set it up you're assuming that each identity has one pri has one primary private key that all the messages are encrypted to, and that all the devices share access to this private key. So, how do you handle the revocation of permission for a device? 
there there will be also draft on revocation i mean uh, there will uh, there should be an option to um that you can say okay this device was hacked so i want to revoke it and that you can then um uh, issue new generation of new private of a new private key which then will be shared again but how can you then encrypt your decrypt your old messages you, you keep your old secret keys I mean, of course, if there is a breach of your device, your past messages at least, yeah. Uh, so if I lose this into the water and hand it to the repair shop, and the re repair shop comes and say, oh, it was stolen, then uh, I have no way to stop the decryption of oh. the old messages from that device. I mean, the idea, if you have at least two devices, the idea would be that you share both of the secret <coughs> keys to both devices so that you have at least one left. I mean, if you have all of them lost, then you have uh, an issue, of course. No, yeah, okay, I'm, so I I, I'm saying that the key, the, the device has been compromised. Yeah. How do I revoke access from that device to my old messages? Yeah. You don't. Okay. You should be able to read them still. I mean, I, I, no, I. I so I'm, I want to revoke his access to my old message. Oh, yeah, that's not in that that we don't have a concept here. But uh, I think we discussed with you yesterday something which could probably. So yeah. if if we don't have a solution to this, then I'm uh, quite worried. So if you have ideas, we are open. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the main intention here for now is we want to encrypt more messages because it's just like we have mass surveillance and uh, nobody's doing I mean there's no no easy solutions for uh, yeah let's say normal people and um, yeah of course if we can do it better so that's why we are also here to me to me this looks like it's an additional feature that may be also added but it's not in our main focus Uh, ADs, any things you want to express? <laughs> you send yeah. stuff to area meetings, this happens to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're just chatting the, uh, with my co-AD saying that this is not dispatch part of the meeting. We don't want to dispatch it. I think we need to you know, we'll talk within ISG about and with interested parties about what to do about this work. Uh, yes, keep discussing. Well, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, guys. So, Hi, I'm Phil Hahn Baker. So, web service discovery. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, oh, I get the remote. I've got the power now. Okay, so, um, so the basic requirement here is I have a bunch of web services, and they're web services that are actually exposed at some level to a user. And so when the user interacts with them, the name that they interact with can only be a domain name or something that looks like an email account identifier. It cannot be a web service endpoint. If you tell users to type in web service endpoints and use them as account identifiers, it doesn't work as OpenID spent, what, 10 years discovering? So, if it's, and the other thing is that if a service is being implemented by more than one host and those instances are slightly different, different encodings, whatever, different versions, you want to be able to go to the host that has the specific flavor of web service that you need. Now, the constraint here is that any of this has to work within the internet as it is and not as we would like it to be. If somebody's trying to connect to a mail or a bookmarks or a calendar or any service like that, it has to work 100% of the time. 
if you have a mechanism that will work some of the time, but if they're behind a NAT, if they're behind a DNS that doesn't give you the full range of records, if they're behind a scripting interface that only allows you to resolve hosts and names, that doesn't work. So this has to work absolutely 100% of the time in the internet as it is deployed today. So you can suggest a better way, a more efficient way of it working for when they've got a capable internet. But you can't say, well, we have to wait 10 years for people to deploy NAPTA or URI records in DNS and support them at the uh, name uh, of the registry, re registrars. OK. And you also want to be able to have a limited amount of service description. You don't need to describe every feature of your service there. We do need to have the ability to say things that would allow a client to choose between two hosts that are offering slightly different flavors of the same service. And this is what then allows you to do a version upgrade. If you've got 100 hosts that are supporting the same web service, they're not all going to upgrade at the same time. And you might have a few around there that are supporting the old legacy protocol, and that number might shrink over time. So, OK. Uh, so there is already a document out there that constrains about 95% of the uh, solution space, and that's RSC 6763, which describes service discovery using SRV and TXT records. And basically, each time I come to do this, I end up writing a piece of document that says, OK, this is how you do it. You go to RFC 6763, and this is what that spec applied to this problem means as far as I'm concerned. And the thing is that each time I do it in a working group environment, it's kind of like, Oh, well, do we want to use SRV records? Ah, do we want to use text records? Oh, we could do it this way, we could do it that way. And that sounds great until you realize that this is a service discovery mechanism. And it'd be really good if all web services could at least, that wanted to do it in one particular way, had one particular way of doing it. Because at the end of the day, standards are about removing choices that don't actually matter. You could do this five or six different ways and still say you're following the SRV and 6763 approach, but when people come to implement them, they're going to have five different ways of doing it. And there's no real advantage of doing it a different way. So in 6763, you've got SRV records and you've got tech that do the basic service discovery. And then you've got the ability to graft on TXT records that describe the service. And yes, they're prefix records. And yes, uh, some folk in the DNS world have not yet got fully on board with prefix records. But that's water on the, on the bridge. It's just happened. Sorry. What you don't get from 6763 is a statement of, well, what happens if you're in a scripting language that doesn't support arbitrary retrieval of um, uh, retrieval of our arbitrary DNS records. Uh, what do you do if you're behind a NAT or if you're behind some sort of firewall that is filtering out records that it doesn't know? And you turn out that, yes, 99% of the time the internet behaves, but there's still enough time that it doesn't. So the proposed approach is basically to follow what's there and clean it up a bit and explain it in the context of if your problem is discovery of a web service, ha this is how you apply that other approach. So we are using the SRV and TXT records as the preferred mechanism for discovery. Uh, and where there's a slight difference is that where we still use SRV records to, to obtain the set of hosts that might implement this service, we have the ability to use a TXT record to describe a service. You know, that is every host that supports that service. We also can use the TXT record to specify the particular implementation for one particular host. 
And so if you've got different hosts that support different encodings, you, know, you might have a CBOR version of your web service and a JSON version, an ASN1 server version, and they're not necessarily on the same host. This allows you to go to the endpoint that you want. And then there's a fallback if you've not got the ability to get that, those records. It falls back to service.domain and use the well-known service uh, and the same prefix to, uh, to, to complete the web service endpoint. And then as the very last chance, it will look at domain. So here's an example. So we've got alice at example.com. And we've got uh, a bunch of uh, records here that are describing various uh, pieces. So we've got two hosts that are supporting the uh, mathematical mesh protocol. And so you look at the top. So the first two are the SRV records that are basically mapping to two hosts. And then underneath that, we've got a CNAME record that says, OK, if you try to resolve mmm.example.com, uh, here's a C name to go to host three. And then if you look down here, we've got host one and host two. Those are the A records that are needed by the SRV. Host one doesn't have, now there's a decoration here. There's a TXC record that says all the hosts support versions one through 2.0. And then here we have at the bottom here on host two, we have a decoration that says, here's the endpoint to use for this particular host. And then at the bottom here, we've got the four back records doing round robin, no SRV load balancing or whatever. It's going to be less efficient, but hopefully that's the 1% of the cases that would otherwise just crash. Okay, so what do we do with this? Uh, what I don't want to have to do is to write this type of thing again and again in different web service type working groups and do it slightly different each time. I'd like to do it once so that then we can have one way of doing it and get some consistency and people can use the same library to support different uh, web services. So depending, what we do with it depends upon the, what people are interested in doing. If people are really interested in this approach and want to define new tags for <coughs> Uh, things beyond the path, the version, and encoding, you know, things that would require actual discussion, uh, then I think that we'd need to form a working group. Uh, but if people just want to do the very simple stuff that's specified in the draft, well, it is little more than a, an increment on an existing specification and just takes that specification and says, here's how to do it for web services. So uh, in that case, maybe an AD sponsored draft if the ADs are interested. So that's it. Comments? Uh, Mark Nottingham, so, oh, Jesus. Yes. <laughs> no, you're, you're Mark Nottingham last time we checked. <laughs> Okay, is that all right? Okay. <laughs> no, there's still a hum. I'm kind of scared. No, not that kind of hum. Um, so what you're describing here feels a lot like RFCs. Jesus. Okay. Okay, RFC 6415, uh, host meta, uh, which is the reason Aaron um, joined me to do uh, the well-known registry originally. Uh, the big difference between what you're proposing, I think, in host meta is host meta uh, uses link relation names as the keys into, in, into the services rather than uh, service names. And, and so um, I, I think maybe one thing that would be interesting to do would be to dig into what properties do you want to get out of reusing service names rather than something else like link relations? Um, because you know, using SRV is not very web-like. Um, link relations are arguably much more web-like. And if you want to use this for web services, you know, the question is, what, what kind of properties do you want to get out of using those? You know, SRV, we're having a session tomorrow about SRV and HTTP and how 
they don't terribly work very well. So that, that's, I guess, where I explore as to why you're taking this particular path. There. Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll have to get my mind around that and uh, let's take that offline. Take, uh, take a look at the host yeah. spec because you might be find it very interesting or you might say, oh, this isn't going to work obviously because of X and that would be interesting because it's not like HostMate has taken off and, and taken the world by storm. So Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing is, I mean, yeah, I've done web services. I wrote the first thing that became a web services standard, I think. Uh, XKMS. Um, so I've been doing it a long time and as I've been going on I've been thinking well this has really got less and less to do with the web and you know I, I, I'm wondering if maybe all the folk were really ever trying to do was to get one round firewalls and so for a lot of them I mean like uh, yes I mean like yes it's not looking terribly webby I'm not sure whether that is a bug or a feature. Um, in the, you know, most of the time when I'm writing a web service, the first thing I do is to say no cache, you know, because you know, I disable all the stuff that's in HTTP and then basically I've ended up with a TCP stream. So the only thing I'm getting out of HTTP now is the framing. And when you start to look at quick, I start to think, well, maybe what we should do is simply just admit that web services are a different thing. Maybe you should take it offline because yeah. th there's a whole industry around this discussion right now. Oh, I know, um, I know. Yeah. Um, but I mean, are, could you use WebSockets for what you want to do or? Uh, well, not really because it's more of a stream than a, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing, thing is that, this is about how do I get to that webby world. This is about how do I do that initial bootstrap that tells me whether I'm going to go over HTTP, HTTP over quick, um, if I'm going to, what type of encoding, which type of version, mm. all that stuff that, this is stuff that the DNS should be providing because that's really what the DNS is about. What it isn't about is telling you things that uh, you can find out after you've started the stream. Yeah. I, I guess at, at the risk of angering another section of the community, um, to me the, the underlying question there is how much do we want to base what we're doing on the DNS architecturally? Like, do you want to be continue to be extending DNS or is it something where we're like, okay, let's keep that in a box because it's got its own issues? Uh, well. I see this as specifying the boundary between web services and the DNS to the extent of, okay, once you've got the TXT and the SRV, you're not going to be extending the number of records you're using again because, so this is kind of like, yes, we're going to use DNS, but no, that next new record that you invent, probably not. I mean, Personally, I couldn't imagine using this. This doesn't seem to have any properties that I need for the stuff that I do. I guess I'm just wondering if anybody else is, you know, if this is a common, there's a common need here or not. Bron Gondwana, I had many of the same questions. If you go back a couple of slides to where you've got, yep, your example, sorry there. Um, I noticed you've got a version with a specification in, is that supposed to be machine readable or human readable? Uh, actually, I copied that out of uh, another. Um, yeah, because my no, first the, the, question at the TXT records, particularly per host, if you have a set of different hosts providing a service, is is some human looking through that list and trying to work out which? Oh one no, no, want no. To, that, is that, that is machine readable. There yeah. is a spec out there that uses exactly that, and so I was simply copying the existing ABNF um, from that specification. Yeah, because certainly if you're trying to select. Which of the which of the hosts supports a particular version of the API or a particular? Uh, we had an example of Quick versus JSON or whatever. Generally, with this kind of service, what I would expect is that the endpoint would advertise what it supports in in an accept header, and you would then know what you could use to communicate with it. Right, but you only get the accept header after you've connected. Yeah, which is after you've chosen the host and started your TCP session, uh, which is a bit late. Well, uh, if you've got some initial bootstrap that it can then point you to the place that supports the new version. 
And this is the initial is, bootstrap. Yeah, the, the initial bootstrap. The other thing I noticed there is you have a path equals slash service on one of the hosts. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about restricting standards, restricting options, um, you've given an option there, and then you have the same IP address for host three, um, which doesn't have that path equals service. It feels like if you only got part of this information, it would fail. You need uh, that to was for illustration yeah. of the capabilities, not yeah, that. But I mean, in practice, unless you've got a web server that is doing things besides web services on that particular domain, yeah. it's never going to come up. Uh, I mean, like, for, for me, I don't really care about the you know, well-known polluting the uh, URI space because you know, the, the hosts that I use are either um, you know, they're just in a different namespace yeah. anyway. The problem with well-known polluting the namespace is it has to be on the top-level domain. It's not on a particular host or a particular yeah. path. So that, but yeah, the, the problem with having something like the ability to specify the path in this is that if you can specify that per host, as you can see, all sorts of, you've got a bunch of extra complexity that will well, be well, rarely used and, and rarely correct. Yeah, again, this is one of the features that, you know, yeah. uh, it is used in existing uh, services that use this type of discovery. So, uh, and given that, and the only time that I would think I would ever use it would be if I had wanted to have one host, I wanted to have one particular host do a particular version. Yeah. Uh, and just have me. that on a different URL because a different uh, thing was behind it. That, that, that's the only case cool. I think I would ever use Thank it. Thank you. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, John, nice. Can you flip the word side again? Here. Uh, no, and that's not, okay, that's not the side of the uh, back, I guess. This <laughs> one, yeah, that was the proposed approach. So, um, my concern about having both SRV and the fallback to that well known is that these are not two things that administrators have to configure and maintain, and what happens when they're out of sync, and so on and so forth. And you've confirmed that you have to have the fallback all the time anyway. So why not just have that and have fewer things to maintain? I mean, yes, it's a bit more overhead to have to go to a TLS connection, but I think the simplicity of for implementations and administrators is much better. Uh, well, uh, in terms of how you are, we're actually going to set something up, I mean, like, yeah. The cases where you would, pro I mean, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, I have hosts that serve my web service. Mm -hmm. and I have, have sorry, my, my website. Mm -hmm. I have hosts that do web services. Okay. And the two are completely separate and always will be. Okay. And so the fallback piece um, is probably always going to end up as being some sort of redirect anyway. So, um, yeah, yeah I mean, that, that, that's fine. But I mean, my point is that it's, you know, it always has to be there. Right, and it has to be correct and the same as the other <laughs> information. It always has to be there if you're going to support, if that particular service is going to support the fallback, yes. And I mean, I guess maybe for any service for which you would expect there to need to be fallback, I'd say don't, don't have it be fallback, have it be the only thing just for. Yeah, but then you can't use the ability to talk about different version numbers, different content types, and do that uh, intelligent host selection. Which people who have been doing the six, uh, you know, the existing services that use SRV and TXT for selection are actually making use of. I think you could still. It might be again a little more over. So, but. so you know, yeah. it is an option. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the way that I do it is that I have a configuration file that I use that describes the service, mm. and then I compile out the DNS and mm. web service server configurations from that source so I mean like you know yeah I mean if you I mean with I mean with correct tooling anything becomes easier but you know if you if somebody's having to type these type txts into DNS by hand and configure the dot well done by hand then I don't yeah. think that anybody can configure DNS by hand and get it right <laughs> the fact that 99 percent is done by hand <laughs> that's, a, that's another argument for not doing Okay. So where do we go from here? All right. Does anybody object? All right. 
if the ADs are interested uh, and I write it up as a personal draft, uh, is that acceptable to people? Is anybody burningly thinks that this is something that needs wider discussion? Adam Roach, yes. Um, so in particular, and I haven't had time to look through the rest of the details, but looking at just what was on the slides here, I have some concerns about the way it's using DNSC names, and I think that would need to go in front of uh, people with a lot more DNS knowledge than, than is present in apps. Okay, yeah. But, yes, so we, 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 we it's, sorry. Okay, so DNS DNSD DNS is probably a place to... I think consultation with them before trying to move anything else forward is probably your next step, yeah. Right, okay. Thanks. And Adam, before you disappear, continue discussion on dispatch list. Is that a reasonable place, or where would you like, or would you like to see it on art? Where would you like to see it? So, I mean, if people in the room have feedback in the draft, I think dispatch is probably like like apps level feedback. Dispatch is probably a reasonable place to do that. I think in terms of uh, driving it forward, uh, I'd like to see the DNS community get involved before we try to do a whole lot of you know more churning on improving the document. Yeah, my, my prior experience with CAA was that um, sometimes it takes an RFC, an actual deployment, before the DNS community tell you how you did it all wrong. <laughs> I'm hoping we can avoid that. Yes, it would be nice to avoid it. Because, yeah, I, I know just how difficult CNAME is uh, having gone through that hassle. And, and one of the things would be that this, hopefully this draft would provide the web services world, you know, if there's one way this has gone through that process, that means that you reduce the risk of 20 people cutting their own and falling into CNAME traps. Yeah, so I, it's, so I mean, I think I'm sort of proxying concern here, but it's like yeah. when I look at this, it's like you've taken a large portion of, of the DNS space and I sort of started squatting on it. It's like you're importing the entire service registry as, as host names effectively. Which seems problematic. So I think that that probably needs a little bit more thinking behind it. Yeah. But again, it, it's more of a, you know, we would need the DNS community to, to give us feedback on that than I'm not an expert on it, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a potential for collision, but only if some, you know, only if somebody has a service foo and they have foo.example.com slash well known slash WKS slash foo. Then you'll get a collision. So, well, no, it, it's more a matter of if I have a host that's already called foo.example.com and it, it's got like, you know, some bespoke HTTP thing behind it, and then I want to deploy something called foo, I would need to have some way of wedging that endpoint onto that server that might not be feasible. Can, so can that's the sort of thing that I can from the DNS guy behind you for a sec? Yeah, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Andrew Sullivan. Um, I don't know if I'm a DNS guy, but I will point out that in DNS op there is currently just finishing or something like that an adder leaf uh, document that is about um, this entire registry and how to cope with it and so on. So there, th this is a long festering problem. I don't know that that document gets it like makes it any better, but it documents how it works. Um, and and I think it's a it's a known problem that is is as solved as it's ever going to be anyway. Adam Roach again. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That actually pertains pretty well to the like the underscore prefix stuff. I don't, and I'm, I'm talking to Andrew here. I unless I've missed something, that doesn't actually talk about using like non underscore uh, labels on like C names or A records or anything like that, right? Okay. So it, it was the latter thing that I was more concerned about here. So, so this is the general problem, though, of the of the entire TXT record um, uh, challenge. This is the long-standing problem. And the basic problem is that if you have one of those kinds of things and somebody else might come along and register another name in there, then you're hosed. Um, and this has been like the, the constant hosing that we had. We had this problem with SPF. We've had this problem with um, you know dozens of text records. We have this problem today with every mail service in the world who tells you, put this TXT record with this key at the um, at the apex of your zone. And what happens is you've got like 500 TXT records at the yeah. apex of your zone, and it's an immediate DDoS problem. 
There is no way to solve this generally without some kind of registry. Um, if, if you want my personal opinion, the DNS is like well overloaded at this point, but uh, you know, it's, um, it, it's the way that people are gonna do it because that's the database we got. Yeah. So we're at our open microphone thing. If anyone has a burning issue the whole room needs to hear about, now's your chance. Burn, Jesus, burn. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how it works as far as I understand it. <laughs> uh, I, I mentioned it before. Uh, we're having a little side meeting uh, on Tuesday about uh, HTTP and SRV because some people keep on saying, why doesn't web, why don't web browsers support SRV? It's so easy. And other people say, you're insane. So we're going to get them together and have a nice chat and see if we can at least kick that ball down the road a little bit. Right. What, what, what time? Tuesday, 6.30, so that's after the HTTP session, um, in the uh, square Dorchester room, I want to say. <laughs> No, no, no. That's. I, I think you said Barry Bleak on the mailing list. Oh, did you? Okay, so we're having it. In, all right, so we're having it in the IESG room then. All right, thanks. Well, with that, thank you very much. Um, make sure the blue sheet gets back to us.